Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in, in Chicago, first time I've, I've been here. It's currently 2 a.m. for me, so um, apologies if I don't make any, any sense. Um, I'm going to talk to you this morning about a collaboration between two groups at the University of Queensland. One is the group that I work in called the, um, the eResearch Lab, which is in the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering. Head of that group is Professor Jane Hunter. And Lian Li Gao is a PhD student in that group, and this is mostly her work I'm presenting. You notice I'm not one of the authors here. Um, Jane was asked to come and present this, but couldn't, couldn't make it, unfortunately. She would have, would have loved to be here. I am, however, chair of the PhD committee that, that is analysing Lian Li's work, so that, that's my connection. Um, the other group within the University of Queensland that we're collaborating with is the uh, Ecolab, Ecology, Conservation and Organism Biology Lab. Um, Hamish Campbell and Craig Franklin, two of the lead researchers there, um, they're pretty unique guys who actually go off into the field and put GPS trackers on, on the back, backs of animals to try and understand the effects that climate change have on, on animal behaviour. Um, and you'll notice there on the left, there's actually a, a, a crocodile with a satellite tagger on it. These guys actually used to work with Steve Irwin and capture these crocodiles, put the tags on the back and, and track them. Which is how, how I, I, I came across this group. I actually worked on a project that was fun, funded by the Australian National Data Service to collect that, those, uh, those GPS tracking, information from those GPS tracking devices, ingest them into a repository, and provide access to a bunch of um, spatio-statistic tools for an analysing that data. So this is a, a couple of cassowaries up in, in northern, northern Queensland, and we've analysed their, their, their satellite tracking data and um, done some home range analysis there. So that's, that's my connection, connection to this group. So that GPS tracking stuff is about analysing where animals are. I'm not going to be talking to you about that today. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you about is not knowing where animals are, but knowing what they're doing, which is an, an interesting new, new activity that this group is undertaking, and is some, some work that's grown out of that animal tracking work um, and that Leanne Lee's got, got involved in. This involves putting little accel accelerometers on the backs of animals that are about this big. They're increasingly becoming more and more um, uh, available, about $500 at the moment, but we're seeing the the, the price drop, um, putting them on the back of animals and seeing if we can detect from the triaxial um, accelerometer data what the animals are doing. What I'm going to talk to you today about is, uh, is why, why these ecologists are interested in, in, in doing that, um, give you some objectives of, of Leanne Lee's work, how she's gone about uh, building a system to try and, and capture this and, and manage and um, analyse this data, and give some conclusions and, and further work. I should say that given I'm not the lead author, any difficult questions I'm going to pass on to them, but any, any congratulations you, you should pass on to me. <laughs> All right. So these, these data detection de devices are becoming more and more used in the, in the ecology community. Um, they're very small, 40 millimetres by 16 millimetres deep. Um, Limited memory, only 16 megabytes of memory, which means you can collect about four days' worth of, of um, activity off these, off these things at, at the moment. So you have to put them on, on an animal and then collect them off the animal to, uh, to get the results back. Very light, only seven grams in air. I think they're only about two grams underwater, so don't really uh, interfere with the animal too much. And they can sample anywhere between one or 30 times a second. And they sample three axes, X, Y, and Z axes for accelerometry data. Um, we're seeing an explosion in use of these accelerometers to monitor animal movement and behaviour, mainly because they're becoming cheap and affordable and they're light. Um, as a result, these ecologists are collecting 
an avalanche of, of, of this accelerometry data. Um, and the sort of information they get back is raw CSV files, but, but if you map it into a plot, you get a plot like the one over on the right there of X, Y, and Z accelerations. Um, the group at U University of Queensland are putting them on endangered species, such as some crocodiles, um, pest species, such as bats and dingoes, that are, their activities are starting to encroach on humans, so we want to understand um, how their activities are changing. And this group doesn't do, that at, do it at the University of Queensland, but a lot of um, livestock folks are interested in, in analysing when their sheep eat, for instance. So they're, they're being widely deployed. Step one, put it on the back of this animal, collect the data, graph it like that. Traditionally, the second step that these ecologists do is actually look through, they don't even have these graphs, they often look through these CSV files and say, oh, this, 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 um, this bit of accelerometry data here means the animal's foraging, or here they're sleeping, here they're running, here they're feeding, here they're walking. It's so actually usually manually go through and map up these files with, with activities. And then they like to visualise uh, what, what's happening with those animals. So there's a pie chart of, you know, it's spent most of the day sleeping, for example. Why would you want to do that? Well, if you want to understand the, the um, animal's health or energy use or consu energy consumption or food or um, water requirements, then this is, this is useful information beyond just where the animal is, what is it doing where it is? And some, something we haven't done yet, but the, um, the ecologists are very interested in doing, is associating that animal movement data with the animal tracking data we had. So here's the animal moving. This is a dingo on, on Fraser Island. Here's an animal moving around the island. Can we map what it's doing at particular times in day associated with the, uh, the movement? So what are the challenges in, um, in, in analysing these da this data and, and supporting the ecologist's use of this data? Um, it's numerical, unstructured, complex, imprecise and a large volume. If you're doing a sample of 30 times a second over four days, that's a lot of data for someone to manually analyse by hand. Um, additionally, there's poor data, data representation, probably a little difficult to see, but that's just a a CSV file there, and it says on this date there's a value of 87, but it doesn't tell me what 87 means. You know, is it, is it an X, Y, or Z axis? Is it the, is it the temperature? Um, so there's massive volumes of it. There's no common markup, so different groups within the university can't share their data because they don't, they don't have a common um, ontology for the, the types of activities they're trying to monitor for these animals, you know, is it, do, does everyone use foraging or do they say finding food, for example? Uh, there's no automatic analysis tools that we came across. Everyone was doing this by hand. Um, and the, the, the manual markup was very time consuming and expensive thing to do. Often they would sit down, so they'd, they'd have these, uh, this, this accelerometry data, they needed to compare that to a, to a, a source truth. So they'd often take, for captive animals, they take a video of the animal and compare that to the accelerometry data. And say, oh, it's obviously running here. That's what that pattern, pattern looks like in the accelerometry data and do the match. And that's a very time consuming activity. It gets more difficult with wild animals because you can't necessarily take a video of a wild animal. If you put this on the back of a crocodile, you're not gonna be following around with a video camera, right? So how do we, how do we analyse the results of these wild animal accelerometry data. So these were the various challenges that, that Liani um, had, to, had to address in her, in her thesis. Um, possible solutions, well the first was actually just to create a repository for these folks to put the data in so they could share it amongst, amongst their group. But beyond that, in terms of understanding the data, uh, Liani Lee's uh, applied some semantic tagging techniques to attach meaningful descriptions just to the raw data itself. And this is saying, rather than just the CSV file, here's, you know, here's a little bit of XML to say, this is an observation for the x-axis acceleration in meters per second. The location was in Brisbane. It had the value of 87, and the time was then. So actually, so you can actually share this data across, across teams. Um, 
The other aspect of semantic tagging she's applied is to mark up the events in, in that data stream using, sem using semantic annotations and storing those semantic annotations independently of the data so that they can be shared across data streams as well. That way we hope we can, we can actually capture and share the, um, the expert domain knowledge about what, what the various activities are. So that's the semantic tagging aspect of, of the talk. The other talk was about, um, our aspect was about machine learning and support vector machines. Um, support vector machines are a type of very simple machine learning algorithm that's a supervised machine learning algorithm. You have to train it with a, with a data set and based on that training it can tell you whether, it can give you a binary answer saying, yes, this new data does meet the model or doesn't meet, meet the model. So it's a very simple um, uh, machine learning algorithm. It's been shown to, to work very well with accelerometry data, so that's why Leanne Lee's chosen it. So she's, having, she's investigating whether support vector machines can be used to support automatic classification of new data streams if we've got a, a, um, a training data stream. Uh, her objectives in terms of building a system to, to support this community, web-based repository so they could share this data, annotation services so that they could mark the data up uh, with, with the various activities that were happening and mark it up with a common vocabulary so they could uh, share it across groups to, to provide these automa automated analysis services and see if she could refine machine learning, learning algorithms to do a better job. Additionally, the, the researchers wanted very simple statistical visualization of, of the results. So these were all the objectives that, um, that Leanne Lee had for a system. I might try and do a live demo of the system now. Yeah, always dangerous, right? Here it is here. That's a live demo, no. <laughs> so um, you can obviously up upload new data sets, which I'm not going to do here, capture a little bit of provenance about the data, you know, who, who created it, where, what the species was that's being captured, the location in terms of Latin long and a broad description. this bigger as well. Um, I can also also search search on that so I could try and find all of the is that gonna do it? No. All of the things that were, were were tagged with dogs. So these are all of the no that didn't work. Oh well live demo. What I can show you is um, what it looks like to analyze the data. This was, of course, working 15 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, he can miss his life. That's right, it's a real demo. Fortunately, I have one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? I don't think, I don't understand why the server would be down at 2.45 a.m., but you know. Uh, this is the bit I really wanted to show you live because it's where it, where it actually animates. Um, this, is, this is the screen that the, uh, the researcher uses to analyze the data. Top left is the, um, uh, the accelerom accelerometry data. It's a bit hard to see, but the bottom left is actually a video that's, and this is of a, a dog walking here, um, that's synchronized with the accelerometry data. The idea is that when you get to an interesting place in the video or the accelerometry data, you can say, oh, the dog's obviously walking or jumping or, or whatever here. Over on the right is an annotation interface, which you can automatically say between this, this time and this time on the accelerometry data, I'm gonna annotate that this is a dog that's being active, or this is a dog that's being inactive, or this is a dog that's jumping. Um, I should say that Leanne's uh, kind of got what she calls two levels of activity. It's whether something's being inactive or active, and if it's being inactive, if it's being active, what type of activity is it, is it doing? And she trains the algorithm both, both on both those levels. Uh, it's a pity I couldn't show you that live, but anyway, you have to trust me. So the idea is that the researcher goes through and marks up these accelerometry streams with, with, um, with annotations saying what, what's happening at various times. They can then select a bunch of those streams to train the algorithm to say, okay, 
tr give me a model for finding when um, uh, when the dog was running. Create a create a model and then run new data through that model and get a classification of of what the what the creature is doing at, at various times. So they no longer have to, the researchers no longer have to do this by hand, is the vision. Um, system architecture, I don't want to dwell on this too long, I, just, I do want to go into what the data happens. So what happens, so they upload the data into the system, they can view the raw data, they can create these semantic annotations which are stored separately to the data in a, um, in a, a Sesame RDF store, so they're using the OAC RDF schema for annotations. They can then search that, that um, annotation server, find data streams of, of interest to them, train data sets in the, in the support vector machine, and then use those models to, to create new data, uh, to create new annotations. So what I really, whoa. What I really did want to talk about is, um, is how well this system, system worked and how, how Liani um, analyzed its um, efficacy. So first thing she did was create a very clean data set by getting a bunch of her friends to walk around the University of Queensland with these accelerometers on, on their shoulder, uh, four males, four females between 25 and 38. And then she got them to do a set of very simple tasks, three minutes walking, running, sit up, standing, sitting and lying down. She used that as her training set and then she got them to randomly perform those activities over 15 minutes as well to see if she could analyze whether, whether the, the machine, see if the machine learning algorithm could um, detect the, um, the various activities. She also did a, a similar thing for a slightly more random creature, um, reasonably well-trained dogs from friends that she, she knew. Six different dog breeds of various sizes and heights. Um, once again, two minutes of walking, running and standing, two minutes of sitting and lying, and then randomly perform those activities, i.e. let the dog off the leash and do whatever it wants. Um, this is slightly messier data because dogs aren't as compliant as humans. They, they, they do have a mind of their own. So it was in, interesting to see whether um, whether this, this slightly more random data would, would um, give, us, give similar results. And just noting that there was one very well-trained dog that could actually do jumping and, um, and sitting up, that which, which simulates sort of foraging and digging activity and climbing as well. And we'll come back to why that's interesting later. So how did the algorithm perform? Um, these are four reasonably well understood metrics for analyzing machine learning algorithms. And to paraphrase, accuracy is about um, how often thing it gets things right. Oh, my notes here are not, not gonna show it. Um, precision's about how often you, know, you get false positives. Sensitivity is about how often you get false negatives and as is specificity. So what do the results look like? The, the graph on the left is about the humans. Um, and remember that I said there was high level versus low level analysis. High level is just whether it's active or inactive. Low level is about whether they're walking, running, doing sit up, standing, sitting or, or lying. Um, you can see this, is, this does a pretty good job for the humans in the, in, the, um, in the high level. We're getting up between 98 and 99% kind of results on all of those measures. Similarly, for the low-level things, we're getting reasonable results, except for some, some interesting things like sit-ups. We're not getting very good precision, so it's making a lot of mistakes for, for, for sit-ups, but still pretty good results. For slightly noisier data with the dogs, we're getting between 97 and 99%. So still, still pretty good results. The next experiment that um, Leanne Lee did was actually using some, some data from uh, a colleague called Owen Bitter in um, Swansea who um, had attacked, attached accelerometers to, to badgers. There you go, Andrew, there's the badger that you wanted to see. Um, and 
Owen didn't have video of, of the badgers. He's just a badger expert and, and an accelerometry expert. So said he could, de he could determine what a, what a badger was doing when it was walking, running, climbing, foraging, standing and lying with respect to the accelerometry data. So what Leone Lee did with this data was quite interesting. Over on the left is using that, that training data, created a model and then applied it to, to new badger data and was getting similar sort of results that we saw, saw to the dogs. Although a little, a little more noisy, we're getting between you know, mid 70s to high 90s there. Once again, because this is a wilder animal, it's not as compliant as a human or, or a dog. It's just doing whatever, whatever it wants. The information on the right's quite interesting. That's using the badger data, but the dog model to analyze the badger data. The idea being, how, if we haven't got these, these sources of base truth, can we use one animal's model to, to predict and now analyze a, a second, second animal. So that was where the King Charles Spaniel um, uh, training set came in because we thought it was about the same size as a badger and it was doing similar sorts of activities to a badger. The results aren't as good as the raw badger data, but they're still reasonable in terms of, of, of doing science. So quite an interesting result. So what are, what are Leanne Lee's conclusions from this? That um, high level classifiers, that's whether something's active or inactive, are better than low level classifiers. It's easier to detect that than whether something's climbing. But the accuracy is still pretty good. We're reasonably pleased with the results. Human classifiers perform better than dog classifiers, which perform better than badger classifiers. And we think that's because there's more noise the wilder an animal is. And uh, humans are not wild, obviously. Um, Species-specific classification obviously works better than cross-species classification. However, we think we've shown you can do cross-species classification if you get similar sort, sorts of animals and you get reasonable results, which means deploying these things in the field for wild animals it seems, it seems to be feasible. Um, so in summary, Leanne Lee's created a easy to use web-based repository for storing and sharing these, these data streams from accelerometers. Uh, she's created a set of semantic tagging and visualization services to help these researchers mark up those data streams with certain activities. She's then fed those data streams into a, uh, into a machine learning algorithm um, to, that you can use to, to predict or to analyze um, new data streams. Accuracy decreases with unpredictable animals and across species, but it's still pretty useful. Where Leanne Lee would like to take this work is to, to do that integration with the, between the accelerometer data and the GPS data. There's actually units that have both in them these days. So you can find out where an animal is and what it's doing at a certain time of day. Um, she's working with Australia Zoo to, to get data on uh, wild dingoes on Fraser Island who are a bit of a, um, who have some pretty negative inter interactions with humans at the moment, some captive tigers in Australia Zoo, and they're about to attempt to put these on wild birds. They think they're small enough they can actually put these on large birds as well. Uh, the idea is then to, to apply some of the captive animal models to wild animals. So use some of the dog data to apply to pests such as foxes and the, these dingoes. Uh, apply some of the bird, bat bird data to bats who are increasingly encroaching on, um, on kind of farming areas and horses to camels which are extreme pests in um, the Australian desert. Uh, she also wants to see if, she, if other machine learning algor algorithms can give, give better results. And I'm going to leave it there but I will just thank these various people. Um, Owen Bitter who gave us the, the Badger data from Swansea University, um, the China Scholarship Group who, who sponsored Lian Li, who's on the left here. We've got Hamish and Craig in the middle, who are the guys who actually go stick things on the back of crocodiles. <laughs> they've, they've got some impressive scars. And Jane Hunter, who's the, um, who's the leader of this group. And open up to questions. 
Okay, we have just a little bit of time before um, we go to lunch. Just, I think he's first, we'll go back to you. Hi, I'm from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and, and we tag whales and sharks. And um, we have the problem that there's no ground truth. We, are, we see behaviors sometimes that have never been observed before. Um, this looks interesting to me, and I have a couple of technical questions that you may or may not be able to answer. Uh, one of them is that in oceanography, um, there's an enormous amount of time series data, and there is, uh, we, from our perspective, based on what we've seen, there is a lack of off-the-shelf annotation tools for time series data that we can just pick up and use, and so we keep building our own. And it looks like you've built one here, but it looks like there's some, you, you mentioned a standard annotation ontology or something that you're using. Can you comment on that? Yeah, there, there, there are a bunch of emerging standards. Well, there's, there's two competing standards, of course, for, for annotation. There's a W3C group that's just formed to try and to merge those. We're using one called Open Annotation Collaboration. OAC. OAC, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm not sure of the name of the other, but they are. there is a W3C group that's, that's trying to merge them at the moment. You said you had a couple of questions? Okay. Um, it's a PhD project, so <laughs> it, it, it's a little way off being production ready. It's, it's about proving the point. But the, that um, Austrack system that I mentioned at the beginning, that is a production system and that's all about GPS data. So they'd be very interested in getting in touch. Uh, Andrew Trelaw from the Australian National Data Service. We funded Austrack. Um, so the obvious question for me is, I guess, around feedback loops back into the machine learning. Um, you know, you take, you take your dog model, you apply it to your dingo, you get a reasonable match, but you can see where the thing mismatches. Uh, has, the, has Lian Li thought about how you might build in feedback loops that would allow you to improve the classification or either come up with a new model for dingoes in this case or alternatively come up with a delta on the dog model that would allow you to apply it. And then broadening out from that, uh, you can see that there's a whole range of species on a continuum where, you know, as you move further and further away from the original training animal, it's going to get less and less good. So the obvious extension there is to look at how you might crowdsource improving the models or improving the deltas on the models. Yeah. Um, no, she hasn't thought about improving the, the deltas on the models, and I know that because she's had to move on a to a different topic within her thesis, which is now looking at um, uh, sensor, sensor data being collected in rainforests and predicting uh, climate effects of, of that. But I will, I will pass that information back, back to her. It's an interesting question. How would you put a delta on the model? Like, would you, would you hand create something to say, this, we think this is the difference between dingoes and dogs, and what's is that scientifically valid to do so? It's, but it's, it's an interesting one to take back, yeah. Okay, um, I think actually we're, I, I just wanna ask one quick question and then I, I, we're already over time, but I have to ask Um I, it, I noticed on the screen where people were actually inputting uh, the annotations that it almost looked like natural language. So I'm curious, is, you say that there's a standard, um, but do they type in natural language and you then uh, extrapolate what the tag is? Yeah, there's an ontology under, under, underneath it, but we don't represent that to the person. They just start typing in jumping, and it will say, okay, you mean this, this bit from the on, ontology. Okay. That was a, a design decision, yeah. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Okay, well, thank you again.